Hey everyone, so 2019 was kind of a shitty year, wasn't it? And I'm sure we're all glad it's behind us, but at least we got some good movies out of it. So let's take a look at my top 10 films of 2019. As always, I can only rate movies that I have actually seen, which means Parasite is not going to be on this list. I know. I know. I will get to it. Also, this list is based on my own personal opinion and is in no way objective at all because that's not how criticism works. So if you were hoping to see Joker on this list, well, then you clearly don't know me at all. Spoiler alert, it's not going to be on the worst of list either. So fanboys, calm thine tits. Anyway, 2019 top 10. Here we go. Number 10. Ford vs. Ferrari. This follows the story of the Ford Motor Company's attempt to buy Ferrari and their subsequent humiliation when Enzo Ferrari backed out of the deal, mostly out of spite, and Ford's plan to create a race car which became the GT40, capable of beating Ferrari at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. But more than that, it's the story of the friendship between automotive designer Carol Shelby and racing engineer Ken Miles, played respectively by Matt Damon and Christian Bale. Both of these actors were on top of their game, and I loved watching the ups and downs of their friendship throughout the course of the film. Even if it wasn't 100% historically accurate. That big brawl between Carol and Ken that took place on Ken's front lawn, for example, didn't actually happen. And I assure you, no one is more disappointed about that fact than I am. In fact, a lot of the drama in this movie was embellished, if not outright manufactured, but I understand it's not supposed to be a documentary. And it's my understanding that the movie's portrayal of the 24 Hours of Le Mans was fairly accurate, which blows my mind because everything about that race was insane. Entertaining story, great performances, intense racing sequences, and I enjoyed it very much. Number 9. Shazam! Young foster child Billy Batson is granted superpowers by a mysterious old wizard whenever he says the word Shazam! And as he becomes accustomed to his new powers and swole adult body, he learns how to be an actual hero and about the importance of family. Yep, we got superhero movies on this list. I will give you a second to recover from the shock. Second over. This was, in my opinion, the best DCEU movie to date. It was funny, it was heartwarming, it had great action sequences, I loved its message about the importance of family and how that family doesn't necessarily have to be biological. Zachary Levi was perfect in this role, totally nailed the part of a child trapped in a grown man's body. Mark Strong was a great villain because, well, he's Mark Strong, and full credit to the child actors as well. Asher Angel and Jack Dylan Grazer were so good, and the movie's climax where they all share Billy's powers was just pure joy. It's always great to see a DC movie that is not afraid to have fun. My biggest problem with this movie is that I want more, and now I gotta wait until 2022 for the sequel. Number 8. Hustlers. Based on a true story, Hustlers stars Jennifer Lopez and Constance Wu as Ramona and Destiny. Two strippers who, after last decade's financial crisis, hatch a scheme to drug wealthy Wall Street bankers and run up their credit cards. There is a scene early on in this movie where Destiny goes up to the roof of the club she's dancing at for a smoke break, and Ramona is up there also smoking and wearing a fur coat, and Ramona says, where's your coat? And Destiny says, oh, I left it inside. And Ramona spreads her coat open and says to Destiny, Climb in my fur. From that moment, this movie had my attention. Double entendres aside, this was a fascinating story. It would be fascinating on its own, but even more so because it's based on actual events. There really was a group of strippers drugging Wall Street bankers and running up their credit cards. Thoughts and prayers. It has some very funny moments as well, like the scene where Ramona and Destiny are learning how to make their drug concoction that they're going to give to the bankers, which goes about as well as you would expect, considering they've never made drugs before. <laughs> oh, I love that scene. And J-Lo, who looks amazing, by the way, I hope I look half as good when I'm 50, she is great in this movie, and she and Wu work very well together. And if the Razzies do a Redeemer Award this year and they don't give it to J-Lo, fuck them. Number seven. Book smart. Caitlin Deaver and Bernie Feldstein play Amy and Molly, two high school seniors who avoided partying in favor of studies so they could get into good colleges. And after realizing just what they've been missing out on, they resolve to spend the final night before their high school graduation going absolutely nuts. 
This is a wild high school party film in a similar vein as Superbad, which is rather fitting considering the stars of those two movies are siblings. But it's far from a carbon copy of Superbad and stands on its own just fine. Deaver and Feldstein are very funny and likable and endlessly entertaining, and I love how those two are just super over-the-top feminists to the point where when they need a favor from each other, they call Malala. They're kind of poking fun at feminism and activism, but not in a mean-spirited way, mind you. It's done from a place of love. This is not PCU. There are more funny people in this movie than I could possibly mention, but I do want to call attention to Billy Lord as Gigi, who just floored me with pretty much every line she had in this movie. I mean, the bit where she is talking about how she lost her virginity in a graveyard and now the spirits of the dead are possessing her eggs or some shit, just how do they come up with this stuff? My god, this movie was brilliant. Number 6. Invader Zim, Enter the Florpus. After a long hiatus, Zim has finally returned with one last plan to conquer the Earth. But as he unleashes his plan, he inadvertently opens up a black hole of madness known as a Florpus, which threatens to destroy the Earth unless Dib and Gaz can save the day. As a fan of Invader Zim, this was everything I loved about the cartoon and more. It's hilarious, it's weird as hell in all the best ways, I loved what they did with Dib's relationships with Gaz and Professor Membrane. It managed to do some things I did not expect, like having Zim come up with a plan to conquer Earth that might actually work. I guess he had to get one right eventually. And Gurr's Peace is Nice song was worth the price of admission alone. Granted, it was on Netflix, so the price of admission was zero, but you know what I mean. Number five, Dr. Sleep. The sequel to The Shining that no one asked for, but it turned out to be pretty good anyway. Dan Torrance, played by Ewan McGregor, is finally coming to terms with his troubled past, and it seems like he might actually be able to live a nice, quiet, sober life. Until a group of weird-ass people known as the True Knot, led by Rose the Hat, come to town and start literally sucking the life out of people. Don't you hate when that happens? While I don't have any actual box office bombs on my list this year, which is rare, Dr. Sleep did underperform, and I hate that more people did not see this movie because it's really good. The story is pure Stephen King, especially with the names of the various members of the True Knot and... Well, everything about the True Knot, really. Ewan McGregor killed it with this performance, and I enjoyed watching the now-grown-up Dan story unfold, and how it was basically his father's story in reverse, in that he starts off in a horrible place and works his way back up to sobriety and actually becomes a good man. And Rebecca Ferguson may have stolen the show as Rose the Hat. She was delightfully sinister. Such a great villain. Number four, John Wick Chapter 3, Parabellum. After the events of Chapter 2, John Wick has been excommunicated by the High Table and has about one hour before every assassin in the world comes down on his ass. And boy do they! I am a fan of the John Wick series. I love these movies almost as much as the people who star in them. Lawrence Fishburne in particular was clearly having the time of his life. And this is the type of movie that Keanu Reeves was made for. He totally sells every beating he takes in this film. And there are many. The action sequences are brutal and intense and have excellent choreography and sound mixing, and overall, they're just a treat to watch. And they are still coming up with new and exciting ways for John Wick to kill people. In the face! And of course, I have to call attention to Halle Berry action star. Who would have guessed? She was amazing. I do hope she's coming back for John Wick 4. Number three, Avengers Endgame. After Thanos wiped out half the population of the entire goddamn universe with the Snapshur, the Avengers set out on a time heist to claim the Infinity Stones and bring everyone back. Ten freaking years of movies have led up to this moment, and I for one thought the Russo brothers did a great job of bringing the saga to a satisfying conclusion. Despite its three-hour running time, it never overstays its welcome and manages to be entertaining throughout which is more than I can say for a certain other three-hour movie that came out last year. It managed to surprise me more than once, which is remarkable for an MCU movie at this point. The action sequences were great fun, and the big battle at the end makes the Battle of Helm's Deep look like a minor scuffle. They did about as good a job as they could have, giving every character their chance to shine, which cannot have been easy considering how many superheroes they have in this universe now. The emotional beats were done very well, especially with Tony and Thor. In fact, Thor's entire transformation just I still cannot believe they went there but I'm glad they did because it totally worked and we finally got to see Cap with Mjolnir and god that was so satisfying 
Number two, Jojo Rabbit. This is the story of a boy who thinks he's a Nazi, but really he just puts on a silly uniform because he wants to belong to a club. And he has an imaginary friend who is Hitler. I don't know what caused Taika Waititi to finally lose his mind, but God bless him for it because this was so much fun. As was his performance as the very silly version of Hitler. Roman Griffin Davis and Thomasin McKenzie were both great as Jojo and Elsa, and I really enjoyed watching their friendship develop over the course of the movie as Jojo starts out as a wannabe Nazi and eventually works his way up to Are We the Baddies. Really impressed with Archie Yates as Jojo's friend Yorkie, that kid has such good comedic timing. I just laughed my ass off during this movie. It was hilarious. Up until the point when it wasn't. And when that moment comes, it is a huge punch to the gut. And I think the film is all the more effective because of it. Overall, I think it's brilliant, and I can't wait to see what Waititi does next. And now, before we get to number one, some honorable mentions. Spider-Man, Far From Home. While I would prefer a Spider-Man that's a bit more quip-happy, this was still a solid Spidey film. Zendaya was wonderfully weird as MJ, Jake Gyllenhaal was great as the villain Mysterio, and those weird-ass dream sequences he put Peter through were a trip and a half. And I could not be happier about J.K. Simmons' return, because he makes everything better. Well, except the snowman, but that was not his fault. Toy Story 4. Like Doctor Sleep, this is a sequel that I'm sure no one was asking for, but it was still a lot of fun. And they did some very interesting things with these characters, like turning Bo Peep into the Road Warrior, and introducing a toy that has to be on Suicide Watch. Forky was both adorable and incredibly dark. I especially enjoyed Keanu Reeves as Duke Kaboom and his many, many poses, and Key and Peele as Ducky and Bunny were just hilarious. The Lego Movie 2, the second part. I am still amazed at just what Lord and Miller are able to do with a simple children's toy. I certainly did not expect them to go post-apocalyptic, but it totally worked. And once again, they have a very talented cast to work with, a shitload of cameos, and some great music from Mark Mothersbaugh. And somehow they got snubbed by the Oscars again! What the hell?! Uncut Gems. Speaking of Oscar snubs, it is rare for Adam Sandler to star in a straight role, but when he does, he makes it count. He does an amazing job of playing this incredibly tragic character who is hopelessly addicted to gambling and just the undisputed champion of bad decisions. And big screen newcomers Julia Fox and NBA legend Kevin Garnett turned in some great performances as well. Little Women. I imagine this is going to be on a lot of top 10 lists this year and may even take the number one spot on a few of them. It's not on my top 10 because, honestly, the story just didn't do all that much for me. Not because it's poorly written or anything. No, it's fine. It's just not to my personal taste. And that's okay. Not everything has to be made for me. But I still wanted to give it an honorable mention because it is incredibly well made, the cast is fantastic, and there is totally an audience for this movie. It's just not me. And finally, my number one movie of 2019 is... Cats. No, of course not. It's Knives Out. This is, of course, the story of mystery writer Harlan Thrombey, who, despite appearing to be a pretty decent guy, somehow has a family that is almost entirely comprised of assholes. When the apples fell from that tree, there must have been a hurricane blowing. And on the night of his 85th birthday, Harlan suddenly commits suicide. Or does he? Rian Johnson gave us an amazing whodunit that was just expertly done from start to finish. It kept me guessing the whole way through and planted just enough seeds to not give away the mystery, but to still ensure that when the mystery was finally revealed, it totally made sense. The cast that comprises the Thromby family is made up of more talented people than I could possibly list off, and with the exception of Christopher Plummer, they're all playing some variety of asshole and doing a fantastic job of it. Chris Evans was especially good, as was his sweater. Ana de Armas was wonderful as Harlan's live-in nurse, and her inability to lie because of what happens when she does was hilarious. And Daniel Craig as Detective Benoit Blanc. Oh my god, I love this character, I love this performance. It was so much without being too much. And Johnson has confirmed he is open to making more Benoit Blanc movies, and I am here for it. Absolutely brilliant, definitely deserved more love from the Academy, and it is my favorite movie of 2019. 
Well, I hope you all enjoyed this annual dive into Sean's terrible taste in film. Next time, we will cover the worst that 2019 had to offer. Until then, take care.